Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Welcome to our next session, Life Cycle Assessments of Biogas Production. Um, it's certainly a topic of interest at the moment. I think there's a lot going on at both a national and an international scale here. Um, and so I think there's a great opportunity now to sort of have a conversation around life cycle assessments. We've got a really great panel of speakers who are uh, incredibly knowledgeable. Um, so I'll keep my, my session short um, so they can really give you the good stuff. Um, so life cycle assessments are really critical for measuring end-to-end -end environmental impacts of businesses. Um, they demonstrate the interactions between and um, within system boundaries, which of course differ quite, quite drastically according to plant type. Um, but they really allow businesses to accurately assess business practice and really identify opportunities to drive process change. Um, but beyond that, they also provide an opportunity to add and create financial value. Um, and this will really be essential if we're going to establish a successful and profitable industry away from government subsidies and support. Um, there's a lot of talk around farmers' uh, green premiums and, and things like that, and I think that, that that's going to be really taken into, uh, into account, and, and it's really going to pay a big part in the, uh, the valorization of the industry. Um, so I, I'm just going to very briefly introduce the speakers first before we get in, and, and then we'll, we'll get into the session. Um, so first off, we have Lucy Montgomery from the NNFCC, who will be looking at sustainability reporting, the process and the implications, as well as the common pitfalls that, that the organisation has observed over the past six years. So Lucy is a senior consultant at the NNFCC, and she's been working within the bioeconomy for 13 years. Um, she's got a really broad knowledge of the bioeconomy and her expertise in industrial biotechnology, anaerobic digestion and sustainability. So she's got a lot of knowledge, so I really... Uh, give you uh, the opportunity to, to come and ask questions and um, make the most of, of, of her knowledge. Um, after that, we've got Finn Boyku from uh, Future Biogas, um, who'll be looking at the carbon intensity of biomethane and how it's reflective in certification um, and how it lowering emission intensity within a plant's life cycle can be valorized. Um, and then following on from that, we've got Tim Elson, from, uh, who is the general manager of FM Bioenergy. Uh, Tim has been in the industry for the past 13 years, not 30, as I accidentally misheard earlier. Um, so without any further ado, I'll pass you over to, to Lucy. All right, so I'm here today to talk about the process and pitfalls of sustainability reporting. I'm from NNFCC, we're the bioeconomy consultants, and you might have heard from us from our um, annual AD deployment report, our biogas map of the UK, um, various other things we do in the AD sector, but we also cover various sectors outside of AD. So we look at the whole sector of the bioeconomy, biorefining, feedstocks for biofuels and bio-based products, bio-based chemicals. Um, we've just celebrated 20 years of NNFCC, and you can visit us well, that comes at the end. Visit us at stand 302. So the kind of sustainability reporting I'm talking about today is the kind that's mandatory if you're participating in a UK scheme or if you're trading biomethane across borders. So for the green gas support scheme, the renewable heat incentive and feed-in tariffs, if you're lucky enough to still be receiving those, it's direct via Ofgem, um, via the portal and usually by email and it's audited by a third party. If you're reporting to the renewable transport fuel obligation, it's direct to the Department for Transport um, and then verified by a, third, a qualified third party, usually an ISCC certified body. So there's a lies, damn lies and statistics and also lies, damn lies and LCA, but luckily for this kind of LCA work, it's all fairly well regulated if you're accredited on RHI or a feed-in tariff or the RTFO pre-2019. It's all laid out in the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, if you're accredited with RTFO now or the Green Gas Support Scheme, it's all aligned with the second recast Renewable Energy Directive. And this is the same if you're trading biomethane across borders. You have to be aligned with Reg2. And this literally tells us what we are and aren't allowed to do with uh, carbon calculating and sustainability reporting. 
Um, and a friend of mine explained it that the Renewable Energy Directive has three layers. I quite like this. So the first layer is, is it renewable? Okay, it's renewable, but is it green? Okay, it's green, but is it sustainable? So what do I mean by that? So first of all, is it a renewable technology? You need to demonstrate that it is indeed a biogas plant. You are indeed producing biogas, biomethane. So how much biomethane has been injected? Then is it green? So what feedstocks are you using and are they really green? And then the final layer is, is it sustainable? And then the two questions are around land use and greenhouse gas savings. So that's what I'm talking about today. And so if you're FIT or RHI or GGSS accredited, the first thing you have to do when you apply is prove that you're a renewable technology. The next thing you do on a regular basis is prove that all the feedstocks you're using are green. So that's with your FMSQ. And then finally, um, you do your regular greenhouse reporting, greenhouse gas reporting to make sure that it's really a green technology, a sustainable technology. Um, so why do we report to the Green Gas Support Scheme or RHI or indeed FIT? So to demonstrate how much gas was injected so they know how much to pay you and to ensure that they don't pay you accidentally for gas that's not sustainable. So that's if you don't meet the greenhouse gas criteria and if you don't use at least 50% waste. Um, talking of at least 50% waste, how do I know if it's waste? Uh, for the RHI and the Green Gas Support Scheme, um, animal manure is waste, other types of waste are waste, and for these, for the RHI, you don't need to report any emissions, it's completely exempt. For the Green Gas Support Scheme, you do need to report emissions, but only from the point of collection. Uh, processing residues, you also need to report from the point of collection, um, and the same for agricultural residues, and for products and co-products, you have to report the whole life cycle. Uh, for RTFO, the categories are a little bit different, so just because something's a waste um, for Ofgem, because it's a waste for the Green Gas Support Scheme and RHI, doesn't mean it's going to be a waste for transport purposes, they're a little bit different and you could find the list on their website. Um, so coming on quickly to a common pitfall that we see at NFCC. One of them is help Ofgem or the Department for Transport won't accept one of our feedstocks as waste, even though it is a waste. What can we do? So the first thing I'd say is that any feedstock that looks like a product or a co-product, or even a processing residue or an agricultural residue, will probably not be a waste, even if it feels like a waste to you, even if the person was intending to discard it. So the common examples we get are pressed sugar beet pulp, definitely a product, or rather a co-product. So you need a full life cycle um, pathway emissions for that. Whey, also a co-product. Um, cereal chaff, so husks. Um, an agricultural residue, so you also need to follow uh, land criteria. Um, and glycerol is a product. Every now and then you get some of these as a waste, but it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, however, the opposite can be true. So just because something looks like a product doesn't mean it's definitely not a waste. So for example, if you're using, let's say, maize silage, if you're getting in maize silage in a classic route via a farmer, obviously it's a product. But if you're getting maize silage that's, you've received it through a third party handler, it's basically someone clearing out their stocks at the end of the season in order to get the new maize in, um, it's maybe a little bit iffy, the cows don't want it. Um, that, could be, that could be a processing residue, at least, if not a waste. The same for reject biomass pellets um, and anything that's contaminated or spoiled. Um, and the reason for this is that there's two different ways of defining waste. So waste as defined by Ofgem, the Renewable Energy Directive, um, it's about not incentivizing people generating more waste. Um, waste for waste management purposes, the concern is slightly different. The concern is around mishandling waste. Um, the best advice I could give here is that your third party waste delivery company um, should start, should maybe needs to learn about the regulations. So the EWC waste codes are not that relevant. And you can get into a lot of hot water if you stick by those rigidly. But if you understand the relevant rules, um, you shouldn't fall foul of them. And um, despite all of that, good relationships with your waste management company and with Ofgem definitely help smooth the process. Don't, uh, don't bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> um, I'm going 
going to skip this one because I've just seen I've got two minutes. So we've actually just launched a new carbon calculator for the Green Gas Support Scheme. How does it work? Um, so like any environmental assessment, you've got the environment, you've got your product or process in the middle, you've got your inputs and your outputs. Your outputs here um, generate greenhouse gases, so that's CO2, methane, and N2O. Um, and you've also got technical outputs, which are biomethane, electricity, useful heat, and digestate. So essentially, you take the global warming potential of your emitted gases, and you divide them by your products. It's that simple. Um, there are several steps along the way that you need to take into account. So cultivation and harvest, transport, the conversion of feedstocks, that might be making silage or for pressed sugar beet, it's the sugar process, um, then transporting it from the silo or the factory to your AD plant, the digestion process itself, and then the biogas upgrading. Um, so what's new? Okay. This talk is a lot shorter than I thought it was. Um, I'm going to come to the end, um, which is come visit us on stand 302. I'm so sorry. Can you, oh, there we go. Um, thanks, Lucy. Uh, we, I think we will be circulating slides, and, and obviously there's an opportunity to talk through things. There's a lot to it, uh, so I appreciate that there's a lot to fit in in just eight minutes. But Finn, um, over to you. Um. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, hopefully the slides will come up. Oh, do I have to press the button? Ah, oh, here we go, there we go. So hi, everyone, my name's Finn Boyke. I'm uh, from Future Biogas. I'm a sustainability manage manager there. Really nice to see some familiar faces out today. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the green premium, um, so assessing the benefits of lowering carbon intensity uh, with biomethane production. And uh, what do I mean by green premium? I hear none of you ask. Well, uh, by that I mean the sort of financial incentives. Ah, uh, come on. Oh, there we go. Okay. So just like covering this, I'll be covering a bit of context. So. Um, sort of situation up to today, um, then some sort of drivers for reducing that carbon intensity, and finally I'll be talking about sort of next practical steps that, um, that by, you know, biomethane producers can take. Okay, so yeah, a contemporary backdrop. Um, so here's a case study back in, say, late 21, early 22. Um, you can see by this sort of pie chart, most of the revenue from an AD facility came from the RHI. That's probably unsurprising to most of you. Um, now, obviously, with the RHI, there's very little incentive to reduce your carbon intensity. You know, as long as you're hitting that threshold, um, then, you know, very little incentive to, to reduce that further. And that 60% savings is actually relatively straightforward to meet, you know, unless there's some major issues, methane leakage, or you've had a particularly bad crop year. Um, it's relatively straightforward, so very little um, incentive to reduce those emissions. Um, I'll move on to guarantees of origin. So again, several years ago, these were mainly used by utilities, um, you know, for their green gas tariffs, and that was completely voluntary. As long as they were RHI compliant, not really much incentive to reduce carbon intensity again. However, there was a small clause in the uh, Green Ass Gas Protocol, so that's the main framework used by corporates to do their emission reporting. And um, they could use RGGOs to um, offset their natural gas consumption. Their scope one emissions would be zero. And then in, they should be reporting any biomethane emissions in their scope three. Now, in reality, this wasn't done very much. Um, and scope three wasn't so much of an issue, you know, talking several years ago. Um, and also from the producer perspective, you know, it's not such a big um, aspect of, of a, the total revenue. So again, didn't really have m too much of an effect in terms of management decisions. However, let's go now to the last 14 months. So this is the RGGO pricing trend. So this is spot price over the last 14 months. And there's a really dramatic change there. You know, it's a really bullish market and you've seen prices more than triple, um, which is massive. And that's been sort of driven by short supply, you know, still let's say 1% of biomethane in relation to the natural gas consumption or demand in the UK. So still very little supply. 
but also increasing demand. So that says more RGGOs move their way to mainland Europe um, for certain compliance markets, but also a bit of a bill from corporates looking to you know, find a low energy um, supply and a cost effective way to decarbonize their energy supply. So that last particular point is facing quite a lot of uncertainty at the moment, which I'm sure a lot of you will already know. Um, but regardless, um, I can't see prices going down considerably um, over the next you know, several years as there's still such a shortage of supply. Hydrogen's still not you know, really online yet. So you know, it's, I can't imagine it going down anytime soon. So how's this affected to your total revenue in an AD site? So, you can see these are two case studies. Um, the one on the top, that's like an existing biomethane facility, 40 gigawatt hours a year, let's say 50% crop um, or products and 50% waste residue. Um, the bottom one is a site that would be yet to be commissioned under the Green Gas Support Scheme. Um, so you can see the RHI, um, we're now looking at about 50% of the total revenue. So from 70% to 50%, it's, you know, not as much of a chunk um, anymore. You're obviously seeing an increase from the gas uh, sales. That's probably unsurprising, considering the situation in Ukraine. Um, but the really interesting point, certainly from my perspective, is that impact on the RGGO. So now looking at about 25% of the site's revenue based on today's spot price compared to how it was at the beginning of 2022. And for me, that's really where the most direct link is with carbon intensity and the revenue streams from biomethane. So there's two kind of premiums here from lowering intent carbon intensity with um, RGGOs. The first um, approach is with certification. So on the left, that's a breakout chart for certified prices um, or revenue streams for uh, an AD site, and on the right is uncertified. This is under constant flux, and no doubt it will change next week. Um, but you're kind of expecting a premium of sort of around three to eight pounds a megawatt hour for crops and maybe up towards 10 pounds for waste. But as I say, don't take those figures for gospel because it's always changing. It's changing all the time. Um, and that can be maybe 300K a year for an existing site and maybe up to 450K for a new site. So really quite considerable premium there. Now achieve this, to achieve this, you've got to ex um, uh, make a 70% emission saving compared to the 60% emission saving from the RHI. And for a crop site, so for a waste site, that's fairly straightforward. As uh, Lucy mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things like extraction, cultivation of uh, feedstocks that you don't have to consider. So it's fairly straightforward for waste, but for crops, that's quite challenging. So crops, you can expect a carbon intensity of anywhere between, say, 18 to 26 grams of CO2 per megajoule around that area. So to consistently achieve certification, you have to really focus on reducing your emissions. And that may be even more so once you look towards like an 80% saving, which is expected under the Renewable Energy Directive by 2026. So the other premium is uh, corporates looking for low intensity um, energy sources, low carbon intensity energy sources. Now there's been a really dramatic shift in the number of large corporates setting net zero targets. It's been up by about 40% in the last year alone, which is, which is huge. And now um, most of them will be reporting emission reductions in scope three as well. So biomethane, um, the carbon intensity will be factored into that as well. Um, so it's suddenly a bit, more, a bit more urgency with that. Unfortunately, the World Resource Institute removed the clause that you could use RGGOs. Um, which, yeah, kind of unfortunate for the industry. And their main concern was around additionality claims, um, things like how you can report emissions um, under your scope three using these kind of products, but also issues around double counting. So, you know, if you're reducing the national gas grid emission intensity, and at the same time a company's claiming that emission uh, benefit, then there's an element of double counting. So, that's likely going to be included in a wider review of market-based reporting generally. Um, and if it goes in favor of RGGOs, you can expect to see a real premium for RGGOs if they manage to meet those criteria. So last slide here. So next steps, practical steps, I would say really focus on build some um, life cycle assessment expertise in-house. You can't really rely on defaults anymore, particularly if you're feeding products. 
um, and really understand the potential sources of um, well, potential emissions that aren't counted at the moment. So that could be downstream emissions using the gas um, distribution system. It could be the effect of lagoons, um, or it could be um, feed uh, sorry fertilizer transport emissions. None of these are really counted um, at the moment. Um, and then looking at that next, so this is based on um, data from the REA. They're saying that 30% of consignments would say fail um, the 70% emission saving, and 46% would say fail the 80% saving. So it's, yeah, real incentive, a drive there to push down emissions. Next, I'd say engage with your feedstock suppliers. So as you can see from this um, pie chart, your crop production, so this is for a crop-derived site, um, so for your crop or product consignments, 60% comes from that um, crop production, um, and that's mainly your soil N2O emissions and fertilizer production emissions. So you really need to engage your farmers to figure out how you're going to reduce those if you're feeding crops. But also, um, and this applies for waste as well, if you're going down the certified route, every um, amount of feedstock that you feed has to come with, say, a sustainability declaration, or the um, source has to be certified themselves. So that means the feedstock suppliers are saying, you know, you can do an audit on our site. Um, so yeah, it's really important to engage with farmers. And finally, last point, um, engage with your auditors and certification bodies and certification standards, um, limited, um, expertise in this area in the UK. It's still a developing area, so it's important to get in, into there earlier. So that was a really whistle-stop tour. Thanks a lot for um, listening, and um, yeah, cheers. Thank, thanks, Tim. Um, we'll quickly head over to Tim Alston, so you're, he's going to be talking about where and when. Can you, oh, can you still hear me? Sorry, I couldn't hear it then. Over to you, Tim. I'll let you introduce the team. Oh yeah, good afternoon everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm Tim Elson, I'm General Manager for FM Bioenergy. We're part of a large agricultural business called Four Farmers. Um, I've been asked today to talk about methane emissions um, from biogas plants, something we've got 10 years experience of doing. Um, uh, our whole range of services are about optimizing plants and making them run more efficient, efficiently, and this is one of the services that we offer. We work with our German partner company, Schaumann Bioenergy. They've been uh, offering this service for over 15 years in Germany across Europe, mainly in Germany, but now a lot obviously in the UK, but in Italy and France as well. We've surveyed over 1,200 plants, um, and of those, 85% we found have got leaks, and 25% have what we classify as asignificant leaks. That's one leak that's leaking more than one meter cube of methane per hour. Um, the way we undertake our surveys, um, there's lots of technical equipment, such as methane uh, sensitive cameras, um, lasers, uh, sniffers, and some untechnical equipment like plastic bags and gaffer tape. Um, and we'll go around, we'll spend half a day, a day on site, um, looking, at, um, looking at the site from ground floor, then at, then at high level, and do a full survey of the site. I'll put a, a matrix up. When we produce a report, we um, prioritize results um, in the order we think site should tackle the leak. So that will be on the concentration of methane, accessibility, how likely are staff to come in, into contact with that leak, uh, uh, close to ignition sources, that kind of thing. And the last one is um, uh, the liters per hour of methane that's escaping, and we categorize that in three bands, so less than 100 liters, 100 liters to a meter cubed an hour and over a meter cubed. And I've shown the bottom bit there, which is a sum from a site, which is saying that particular site we've looked at, we think that, I'm struggling to see this one down here, I'm afraid, 2,647 litres as a minimum up to 3,600 litres. The reason why I show that, I've grouped, I've graphed every um, survey that we've done since the start of 2022 in the UK. Um, and the green bars there are showing the range of methane slip that we're finding on each of these sites. So that's percentage of total methane production on the site. The blue dots are the number of leaks and the, uh, the orange dotted line is sort of a 1%, which has sort of become industry standard as where we think the industry is sitting in terms of methane emissions. Um, and what you can see is obviously quite a lot of data on there and it's sort of quite messy, but what this says to me is sort of a thir two thirds of the sites are doing quite well and are below that um, 1% that the industry sort of had attached to it. 
but two thirds are probably not doing so well and are leaking, in some cases, significantly more. What's quite interesting is we've got three sites on here at this left hand side which are gas tight. They will be small sites, single tank digesters generally, one CHP, not a lot of pipe work, so less chances to leak. The ones at the far end where there are big potential to leak are probably also small sites because I've got a few big leaks um, but not a huge amount of gas production. So a couple of meter cube leaks per hour can soon add up to you know, two, three, four, five percent of the, of the site's um, production. When you take that as a total, all those sites, we're looking at around 120 to 185 meters cubed per hour. So that's an average of those sites based on the, on the scale. So if you think about that, 120 cubes is gonna be around about 500 kilowatt plant equivalent. Most 60 sites that we've looked at there is, is uh, being emitted. But interestingly, it's 0.4 to 0.7% of total gas. So we're actually below what I think the EA and are looking at as the 1% threshold. So I think some sites, probably the, the sites that are smaller and probably value engineered at construction and maybe not maintained as well, need to do better. But on the whole, I think the industry is doing pretty well. Um, a few areas where uh, uh, very common areas where we find leaks and things that you don't need a you don't need an engineer to come out to um, to sort out. So pressure relief valves. Pressure relief valves are obviously quite regularly opening and closing, whether they're under pressure or over pressure valves. Every time it opens, it has a chance to not reseat properly, and if it's not reseating, you got you, it's going to leak. Mixers. So any any mechanical mixer like that where it's got a winch cable going through needs regular greasing. Quite often we'll go to site and find every every mixer is leaking. But also lots of sites have issues where they're changing mixers quite regularly. And if you're lifting the roof back to change a mixer every six months or every year, whatever it is, you've got the chance of not sealing the roof again properly. So you get leaks on the roofs as well around, around mixers. Carbon filters. Again, if you're having to drop your carbon meter out the bottom of those and put in at the top again, you've got two areas that you've got to make gas tight again. And people can be changing the carbon filters, you know, regularly, you guys know better than me regularly from every other week to once a year, but the more you change them, the more chance you've got of leaks. Bottom left, you, you really don't need a camera to spot methane leaks coming out of there. You can see sulfur deposits, service box on digester roofs. Nice idea at design stage, terrible in practice. Once you've opened those up a couple of times, you're gonna really struggle to make them gas tight. Um, and compressors, where we see big leaks, is often after a compressor. You've got compressed gas, so you've got more flow, um, but also a compressor's gonna vibrate, and welds don't like vibration, flanges don't like vibration, so you get a lot of welds cracking, and a lot of flanges cracking as well after compressors. Um, this is my last slide, um, which is a case study, which is probably not, it, it's positive on one light, but probably not so positive on another light. So this is a, it's a probably a nine, 10 year old site, crop fed, very professionally run. They do surveys. They've been doing the surveys every year and they've now been enforced by the EA to do a survey every six months, which is good for them as this shows. So what we're seeing here, the bit I've highlighted in, in green at the bottom is the first lot, well, you've got emissions via leakages. So that's leaks we've found around the plant. And then we've got emissions via the foils. So that's your, your double membrane roofs. So that's a leak from the inner membrane, which should obviously be gas tight. So we're measuring that on the exhaust vents between the two roofs. And you can see there we're getting you know, half a cube of methane coming out every hour, so quite big leaks. That was on one digester, um, and a total between two and a half cubes and three and a half cubes per hour leaking. We advise them that that, that those that one digester roof needed replacing. Um, as a professional company, they decided they were going to replace all three roofs, and then when they did that, they asked us to come back and uh, resurvey, and they used the professional company to. Um, install the roofs, didn't do it themselves. We went back in February this year, and we've gone from six leaks, five on the digesters, to now we've got 10 leaks, all of them on the digesters. And they're leaking now, it's a bigger range because of the size of the leaks, but we're leaking between 820 liters an hour to 8.2 cubes an hour. We've got less leaks coming via the foils, but now we had leaks on, on the inner membranes, on digester one and digester two. And again, we've had to advise them to go and replace their roofs and their membranes. So they're currently um, in the process of doing that right now. But I think what we're finding now is the Environment Agency are putting into people's permits to do regular methane detection. 
um, and have a mitigation plan to um, to correct any leaks. And this is sort of a case in point of why you why you should be doing that. So just in conclusion, um, I think 1% emissions for the industry is a fair standard, although lots of people are, are doing better. Smaller plants, if they've been built on an economy, on a budget, are more likely to leak a higher percentage. Many leaks are easily avoidable or easily, repa or easily repaired, like greasing winch cables, etc. Gas tie is certainly achievable if you look after your plant well. And we recommend you do a professional survey after commissioning, after any major maintenance, so mi mixers, um, you know, changing presses, etc., or at least annually. And that, I think, was everything I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, really interesting. I think it's definitely a topic that is coming up more and more in conversation, both again on national and international scale. And uh, I think it's a really important thing for the integrity of the industry to. to understand where their, their leak is coming from, essentially. Um, I'm just opening up the floor to questions before I go on to mine. So you've got the microphone. Hi, uh, uh, Josh Maynard, uh, Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. Um, the Fugitive Methane stuff you showed is really interesting. Um, I'd say in literature, I've seen studies, possibly Danish ones, saying 2% is much more of an average representation, and they use a tracer dispersion gas method. And I saw in your method you're saying we're measuring it with bags, or so it's a point source measurement. I guess the question is, you gave a range. How confident are you that that's, you know, a, is that a systematic underestimate, effectively? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, so it is, it is an estimate, and last year the same thing, I gave a similar presentation last year, and the guy who did the Danish study was here, and I think what he said was, when you look at that higher estimate, that was from a lot of slurry stores as well, so uncovered lagoons, and when you actually looked at the digester, there was a guy from Fleur who produces the methane camera, the Danish uh, survey person and myself, and we all, we all sort of were in agreement that at 1% is about where we see the industry. In terms of Estimating it is difficult, and there is some anom. I, you know, our, so when we're using, uh, when we're measuring gas slip from the foils from the membranes, we we know that's accurate because we can put a bag on it and tape a bag to it and measure airflow and concentration. So we know exactly what's coming out of there. But if you've got a leaking roof or a leaking compressor, you can't physically seal that off and measure flow. You can measure concentration, but you can't measure flow. So we are making these broad brush estimations. And what I would say is when we're saying so we're doing a, a low level and a high level on the two lower categories. When it get into a meter cube, we are saying it's a meter cube. It could be 100 meters cubed an hour, but we're just using the one meter cube. That's quite a big leap, but what happens is our, our engineer goes on site, takes photos, takes videos of every leak, and then he has um, video footage from the manufacturer, from the camera manufacturer, so he can look at each leak in, in the office and say, right, this one here looks most like this level. So he can categorize himself, but it's a lot of, lot of it's experience. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter Winter from Thames Water. Perhaps just following up on this, in terms of the Mason cameras, are there uh, are they methane specific or do they have cost sensitive to sensitivity to other hydrocarbons or uh, uh, and uh, is this known cost sensitivity or these sort of things? Yeah, so the, the, the camera is, will pick up any hydrocarbons. It will pick up any hydrocarbons, but we also have a laser which will differentiate between the two. So we do find a lot of leaks on grid entry points on, on the propane system. They're generally very small leaks because it's five, 10 mil pipes and lots of, lots of flanges, lots of connections, but we generally find leaks on those, but they'll be small, but yeah, we can identify whether it's methane or propane in those situations. Yeah, that's with a laser, yeah. Yeah, so you can, so you can shine a laser and it will, it will tell you what hydrocarbon it is, yeah. But the, the camera will pick up every hydrocarbon and then you have to use a laser to identify. But on a biomethane plant, it's all gonna be methane, unless where you've got propane on site. Any other questions from the audience? Um, 
I, uh, I have, um, I've got a question. So thinking about the, um, your comments around the Green Premium, um, and I think we're, we're at a stage, particularly in the UK, but, but really globally, where we're focusing on um, paying for energy production as opposed to carbon mitigation in those support schemes that, that are out there. And I guess my question for the whole panel, but possibly more um, Finn and Lucy, is what government, what would you like to see from government to help, I guess, open up um, the potential for the Green Premium? Sorry, what was the question? How would I, what would I like to see from government to, to get the Green Premium? Yeah, I think one thing I'm quite disappointed about is that um, when we do a sustainability reporting, you know, the mandatory one, we don't take into account various things like poor digestate management, um, real life methane emissions. Um, you know, most of this isn't taken into account. And I think I'd quite like to see that incentivized a bit better. Um, although obviously it'll make people's plants harder to run. I think I would also say to anyone operating a plant, we're not just here as the AD industry, we're also here as citizens. So if it's within our power to reduce emissions by improving digestic management, by, by carrying out tests to see our, where our fugitive methane emissions are, I think we should be doing that. Yeah, sure. So going back to the sort of guarantees of origin, I guess it would be good to see a centralised register, I'd say, and um, something where you can report the carbon intensity. So either you align that with a proof of sustainability, like you do with the certified route, um, or it's an aspect of the actual RGGA mechanism. Um, so I think that would really add some value and make it a bit more transparent about, about the emission intensity of biomethane. Because at the moment, there's no distinction between something that, let's say, 32 grams of CO2 per megajoule per s versus something that's, I don't know, five grams of uh, CO2 me per megajoule. So yeah, a bit more visibility, I'd say. Are there any other questions from the audience? It's been quite a quiet audience this this session, uh, which I'm quite surprised given there's so many of you. Um, so I hand over there. Hello, um, I have another question regarding methane leakage. Um, do you find that it's correlated to specific digester technologies? or let's say one stage, multi-stage? Or is it more about you, what you were saying about management? So about whether sort of easily preventable leakages are actually taken care of rather than the technology itself? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I probably have to be a little bit careful with what I say here. Um, uh, with regards to different technologies, possibly not. We see some, we see some digester types where like the worst site I will see in the UK has, we cat on. The, it was the worst in terms of leaks on that one, but we'd actually grouped a lot of them together. Yeah, the digest had 50 leaks on it, but we'll go to sites built by the same company, and they'll be, you know, very very good. So I think sometimes it's around the maintenance. And that's a particularly difficult type of construction to maintain. Where we do see a number of leaks, and I said in the presentation, is around compressors. Particularly, that wasn't on a gas upgrading system that I showed there, but on gas upgraders, on the compressors, we see a lot of leaks. You have big, big buildings with big compressors in them, and the whole building is shaking, basically. And it's, you know, it's terrible for cracking welds. But generally, I, I would say it's more around how well the plant was built in the first place, and then how well it's maintained. 